ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel, the fourth book of Moses, the law, the book of Numbers. We enjoy, invite you to get your Bible and join us today if you'd care to. And I want to announce something uh, early in the broadcast today. In our last lecture, we uh, utilized a print uh, entitled uh, Israel's Encampment by Night. And I mentioned that we do not carry that print here at the chapel, but we know of a source for that print. And we have since learned that that print is no longer available. So uh, if you had made a, a note to write in this weekend or sometime asking for that information, disregard. I'm sorry it's not available anymore. Uh, and so that's the way it is. And with that, uh, we're going to pick it up today, chapter 4, verse 1. And in chapter 3, we had that numbering of the Levites from the age of one month old upward. And that numbering was for the purpose of exchanging the firstborn of the other tribes of Israel, the males, uh, who God claimed in Exodus chapter 13 to serve in the tabernacle. And now he's changed that to where it's going to be the Levites who are going to serve in the tabernacle. And we had a difference of, what, 273 uh, more firstborn of Israel for which they were required to pay five shekels apiece, the uh, redemption price of a male child. Now in chapter 4, we're going to have another numbering of the Levites but this time it's going to be for those who are in service. And we'll see also in chapter 4 what the service of the various uh, three major families or divisions of the Levites was. And I remind you that uh, the Kohathites, one of the families, the Gershonites and the Merarites, uh, are the order that we're going to be dealing in, whereas in the previous chapter we went by age of the sons of uh, Levi. That then was Gershon, uh, Kohath, and Merari being the youngest. And now we're going to switch up the order, the Kohathites first, Gershonites, and Merarites last. And this is based on the sacredness of the work that they did in and around the temple. And more on that I'll explain as we go. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name with that introduction. Pick it up today, chapter 4, verse 1. Let's hit the ground running. And it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Verse 2, Take the sum, or the count, of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families by the house of their fathers. Verse 3, From thirty years old and upward, even until fifty years old, all that enter into the host, and this word host is, is like it signifies military service, and God looks upon this as his army, the army of Yahweh, to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, some are confused by the fact that when we get to chapter 8, verse 24, uh, we'll see that the, uh, the Levites actually start laboring at the age of 25. But if you have a companion Bible, you're fortunate. Uh, Bullinger makes a note on this at this point right here in your side margin that they uh, entered into service at the age of 25, but they served a five-year probationary period. And then at the age of 30, they obtained uh, actual responsibilities that they had on their own and were responsible for. And what further probably complicates the situation is the fact that when we get to the down several centuries from this point in time, uh, David will change the age of the uh, service, that the age that the Levites go into service, to the age of 20. Uh, you can read about that in First Chronicles chapter 23, verse 24. And the reason that David, and that was by divine instruction, you know, God uh, didn't, isn't leaving anything to chance here, and he didn't leave anything to chance with David either as far as the uh, building of the Temple of Solomon, the directions of how it was to be, and also the service 
of the Levites and God's directions of the age of service of the to the next encampment site and then uh, reestablish it. After all, the Temple of Solomon was a permanent structure, uh, not built to be moved from location to location as the Mosaic Tabernacle was. Verse 4, This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. And again, the sacredness of the items that the tribe or the family of the Levites was responsible for uh, determines uh, what order we're dealing with here. And the Kohathites, as we'll see, responsible for after and only after the priests had prepared the items in the inner court and also the Holy of Holies to be moved, then it was the, the responsibility of the Kohathites uh, to come in and bear uh, these vessels and furniture on their shoulders, on the staves that were designed for them to carry on. I'll remind you, too, Moses and Aaron themselves uh, were Kohathites. Verse 5, And when the camp setteth forward, or when they're moving from one place to the other, Aaron shall come and his sons, in other words, the priests, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Now, the covering veil is the veil uh, that separated the inner court of the tabernacle from the Holy of Holies. So, again, note it's not the Kohathites that go in and prepare it, because that would have been a certain death, as we'll learn in a little bit later in this lesson, for the Kohathites to go directly into the Holy of Holies. And I couldn't help but think, aren't you glad that today, uh, after Christ paid that price on the cross, uh, that and, and when, what happened when he was crucified, when he gave up the Spirit, uh, he immediately went to heaven, and that veil was rent from top to bottom, uh, making it possible for uh, you and I to go directly in and talk to the Father at any time that we choose to. At this particular time, there was a very limited, less than a handful uh, who were allowed to go into the Holy of Holies uh, and not be struck dead by God. Verse 6, and remember that Ark of the Testimony at this time is the throne of Yahweh here on earth. 6, and shall put thereon the covering of badger skins, and shall spread over it a cloth wholly, or better, probably completely, of blue, and shall put in the staves thereof. And a couple things on this verse. In, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 15, we learn that the poles or the staves uh, that were inserted through the rings along the edge of the Ark of the Covenant were to remain in place. So what's going on here is obviously they'd have to take the staves or poles out of the rings and remove them in order to cover the Ark of the Testament with this blue cloth and uh, this animal hide. Uh, then, they, of course, then they would put the staves or poles back in before the Kohathites could come in and then uh, bear the Ark on their shoulders. Badger's skin, not any way, shape, or form. That would be like saying they came in and put swine's flesh on the Ark of the Covenant. It would have had to have been a clean animal. Uh, I think something on the order of antelope uh, hide or fur, because what we're looking for here is protection from the elements as they were transporting the Ark from one location to the other. And if it started storming or raining, uh, it would need to be protected from the elements. So that is what I think the case was. It was probably uh, antelope, definitely a clean animal of some type. The blue, uh, always uh, symbolic of royalty, and there is no higher royalty. Verse 7, And upon the table of showbread uh, this, uh, they shall spread a cloth of blue, again, royalty, and put thereon the dishes, 
and the spoons and the bowls or pans and the covers to cover with all. And the continual bread shall be thereon. The continual bread, uh, the instructions given in Leviticus chapter 24. Uh, the continual bread, of course, is the show bread. In the Hebrew, it's called the bread of the face. All of these, though, utensils uh, designed and the instructions given to Moses by our Heavenly Father in the book of Exodus, and he was given several artisans who were to craft or make these particular uh, vessels and uh, utensils, tools, uh, probably a good word as well, uh, for ministering in and around the sanctuary. Verse 8, And they, this being the priest, shall spread upon them a cloth of scarlet, again royalty, this crimson color, and cover the same with a covering of badger skins and shall put in the staves uh, thereof. The poles uh, you could think of as what the staves uh, also are called. Again, badger, bad translation, would have had to have been a clean animal, most likely, again, a, a type of antelope, if not uh, the antelope himself. Now, the Gershonites and the Merarites, as we uh, had talked about it briefly, and we'll see when we get to chapter 7, are given wagons and oxen to transport the materials that they're responsible for moving of the tabernacle. Not so with the Kohathites. Uh, they will uh, be required to bear these pieces of furniture, the heavier ones and the materials, the tools, on their shoulders. And uh, in the case of the Ark of the Covenant, for example, you probably would have had at least four, if not more, depending on the length of the poles, uh, Kohathites on each corner of the Ark to bear it. And uh, of course, with as many Kohathites as we have in service, and we'll get to that number uh, later in this chapter, no doubt that they frequently could uh, change off and have a fresh uh, back and set of legs uh, take over uh, multiple times through the day. So it wasn't like uh, four men had to carry it all day long. That would not have been the case. Verse 9. And they shall take a cloth of blue, again we see royalty, symbolic of, and cover the candlestick, this is the menorah in the Hebrew language, of the light and his lamps and his tongs and his snuff dishes and all the oil vessels thereof wherewith they minister unto it. And these instructions given to Moses by our Heavenly Father in Exodus chapter 25 concerning the menorah. Now, when we think of a candlestick, as it's translated into the King James Version Bible, uh, today we think of a candle as a, uh, a round wax object that has a wick throughout the length of it, and as the wick burns, it melts the candle, and down in there you have the light coming out. Not so at this time. The candles uh, were actually, they had all of them, of course, had a wick of which would burn, but they simply were in oil, and the type of oil most often, uh, olive oil, the oil of our people. And uh, then the oil had to be replaced from time to time, of course, uh, and, and that's the reason for the tongs in which they would pinch out the light when it was necessary to change out the wick and, and empty the container, the snuff dishes, in other words, and to change out the wicks. Verse 10, And they shall put it, the candlestick, and all the vessels thereof within a covering of badger skins, and shall put it upon a bar. Or Moffat translate this bar as a stretcher, and I think probably more, though, that it was uh, as the uh, table of showbread and also the uh, candlestick and the other 
uh, the Ark of the Covenant uh, was somehow put in this antelope hide to where it could be uh, placed on the shoulders, the poles could be placed on the shoulders of the Kohathites, and they could carry it in that manner. Verse 11, And upon the golden altar they shall spread a cloth of blue, and cover it with a covering of badger skins, and shall put it to the staves, put to the staves thereof. And this uh, golden altar, of course, the altar of incense, uh, made of not only gold, but is instructed in the book of Exodus, made of shittim uh, wood as the boards of the tabernacle, much of them were. Twelve, and they shall take all the instruments of ministry, wherewith they minister, this is the priest, in the sanctuary, and put them in a cloth of blue, and cover them with a covering of badger skins, and shall put them on a bar, well covered and protected uh, for the journey. Verse 13, And they shall take away the ashes from the altar. Now this is not the altar, the golden altar mentioned in verse 11, this is the altar of burnt offering. Take the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth thereon. Now, uh, at this time, God established the way to uh, atone for sins was through various offerings, sin offerings, uh, burnt offerings being a different type of, of offering. And uh, But, of course, today it's not burnt offerings that God wants. But understand, at this time, the law, uh, it was uh, blood sacrifices were made, and they, most of them were on uh, the altar of burnt offering. Verse 14, And they shall put upon it, this is the altar of burnt offering, all the vessels thereof, wherewith they minister about it, even the censers, the flesh hooks and the shovels and the basins or bowls, all the vessels of the altar, and they shall spread upon it a covering of badger skins and put to the staves of it, put the poles in place. And those of you who have a Smith's Bible dictionary, if you look up Ark of the Covenant, they'll have an artist. Uh, rendition of what they think uh, based on biblical descriptions that the Ark of the Covenant uh, must have somewhat looked like. And you'll see that along the edges of it there are rings and this is where it was designed so that the poles uh, could be placed in the rings to make it easier for the priest to bear these. And all of these no doubt uh, having rings, the altars I'm talking about in the showbread table having rings on them so that they could be easily carried by the uh, Kohathites. Now, there's one item that's not mentioned here that is closely uh, related to the censers, the flesh hook, the shovels, basins, and vessels of the altar that's not mentioned here. And if you look in Exodus uh, chapter 30, verse 18, there was also a copper laver and it's thought that being made of copper, uh, it would not be necessary to protect it from the elements, and therefore the priest probably uh, just carried it uh, without having to cover it with the antelope hide to protect it. Verse 15, And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary, and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward, after and only after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. And do you think God means what he says? You better believe he means what he says. And uh, we're not going to go there, but First Chronicles chapter 13 and also Second Samuel chapter 6 both document what happened when God's instructions weren't followed. And what was going on there was David was going up to Kerjath-Jerim uh, to bring the Ark of the Covenant 
uh, back to Jerusalem or to Jerusalem where it would be placed in the temple uh, in the tabernacle there. And uh, what happened was, well, they messed up. They didn't go by God's instructions. They did the same thing that the Philistines did when they returned the Ark of the Covenant. They put it on a cart drawn by an oxen. And when they came to a rough place in the road, Uzzah, one of the priests who was not qualified, reached his hand up to steady the ark because it was about to fall off the ox cart, and God struck him dead right there. And uh, it hurt David's feelings, something awful, and everyone else. They couldn't figure out what they did wrong, but uh, I guess they decided then to pull out the Torah and do a little reading of God's instructions and then they moved the ark properly and were successful. But God means what he says, verse 16. And to the office or the responsibility of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, pertaineth the oil, this is the olive oil, for the light or the menorah, the candlestick, and the sweet incense, the incense that would be offered on the golden altar, the altar of incense offering, and the daily meat offering, and the anointing oil, and the oversight of all the tabernacle, and of all that therein is uh, in the sanctuary and the vessels uh, thereof. Quite a bit of responsibility uh, given to the eldest remaining son of Aaron, uh, that being Eleazar. Nadab and Abihu, his two older sons, as we learned in Leviticus chapter 10, uh, God struck them dead for not uh, following his instructions. And, you know, it would be Eleazar, who there's another son of Aaron at this time, Ithamar. Uh, he has responsibilities as well, as we'll see a little later in this chapter. But uh, a lot put on uh, Eleazar. You may remember already that the princes of the three major tribes, uh, uh, families, I should say, of the Levites were to report directly to him. Now we see other responsibilities being put on him, but he was up to the task. In fact, he had a son, and we'll see when we get to chapter 25 of this book, Phinehas was his name. And what happened there was the Israelites were uh, participating in worship of the Moabites, uh, their god, uh, Baal, and therefore uh, God had a, a plague going on among them. Some 20,000 died. And as a Moabitic woman went into the tent of an Israelitish man uh, to lay with him, Phinehas followed them with a javelin and went into the sleeping quarters and ran them both through into the ground. And God saw that and he stopped the plague. And because of the zealousness uh, of Phinehas, the seed line uh, that the high priesthood would stay in from that point on was the seed line of Eleazar, verse 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, 18, Cut ye not off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites. God saying here to Aaron particularly, take care that you and the other priests don't fail to prepare the holy items uh, sufficiently that the Kohathites are protected. In other words, they're not to see or touch any of these materials and if you and your sons and descendants will do their job, it won't be a problem for the Kohathites. But if you don't, it's going to be a problem for the Kohathites. 19. But thus do unto them, the Kohathites, that they may live and not die when they approach unto the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint them every one to his service and to his burden, as set forth in verses 5 through 15. 20. But they shall not go in to see when the holy things are covered, lest they die. Again, less than a handful at this time are allowed into the holy of holies. 
Uh, again, I'm happy and glad that that veil has been rent now to where we can approach God uh, after Christ paid the price. 21, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Now we come to the service of the Gershonites. 22, Take also the sum of the sons of Gershon throughout the houses of their fathers by their families. And we're going to see these counts up toward the end of this chapter along with the counts of the Kohathites and the Merarites as well. From thirty years old and upward until fifty years old shalt thou number them, all that enter in to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, this, to perform the service in the Hebrew is actually to war the warfare. And these, these men are in God's army, you know, and we're counting God's army here. Let me ask, are you ready to serve God? Uh, can He count on you? 24. This is the service or work of the families of the Gershonites to serve and for burdens or what they are to carry. And I might mention, too, at this point, we've talked about the, the youngest that they're to be numbered at, but why was it that they were numbered up to the age of 50? And we'll find out in a later chapter that at the age of 50, the Levites did not retire but no longer would they do laborious work as far as uh, tearing down the tabernacle, transporting it, and putting it back up. Uh, they were still to, to minister in the sanctuary, but they were relieved at the age of 50 of uh, arduous uh, labor. 25, And they shall bear the curtains of the tabernacle and the tabernacle of the congregation his covering, made probably of goat hair, and the covering of the badger skins, uh, this would have been a clean animal of some type, not badger, that is above upon it, and the hangings for the door, this is the entrance to the tabernacle, not the veil uh, that covered the Holy of Holies, of the tabernacle of the congregation, all of the tent the material, the coverings, the curtains, and uh, items, ropes that were utilized to affix them in position. 26, and the hangings of the court and the hanging for the door of the gate of the court, which is by the tabernacle and by the altar round about, and their cords or ropes and all the instruments of, of their service, and all that is made of them, so shall they serve. The tent, the curtains, all their coverings. And again, remember these, the Gershonites were given two uh, carts or wagons along with four oxen by the tribe princes. We'll see in chapter 7 again, uh, those donated to the service of the tabernacle. 27. At the appointment of Aaron and his son shall be all the service of the sons of the Gershonites in all their burdens and in all their service. And ye, this address to the priests, shall appoint unto them in charge all their burdens. 28. This is the service of the families of the sons of Gershon in the tabernacle of the congregation. And their charge or responsibility shall be under the hand of Ithamar, uh, the son of Aaron, the priest. So here we see some authority and responsibility being delegated to Aaron's son, Ithamar. And it will be the case with the Merarites, too. Remember, the, the tribe princes report directly to Eleazar. And we learned that in chapter 3. But here we see that the, as far as the taking down and transporting and then reestablishing, uh, rebuilding the tabernacle at a new campsite, uh, Ithamar was responsible for that. 29. As for the sons of Merari, the third uh, and final uh, major division of the Levites, thou shalt number them after their families by the house of their fathers. Verse 30, 
from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, shalt thou number them, every one that entereth in the service to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the service, again, war, the warfare in Hebrew. 31, And this is the charge of their burden, according to all their service in the tabernacle of the congregation. The boards of the tabernacle and the bars, these made of shittim wood also, Exodus will tell us, thereof and the pillars, these would have been made most likely of acacia wood, therefore and sockets thereof, the sockets uh, were made out of brass. And the mosaic tabernacle designed where it could be fairly easily disassembled and then transported and then reassembled in a relatively short period of time. And these boards, remember, ten cubits in length, one and a half cubits in width, and the breadth of them not written, but surely two inches, I would think, as you know, a board today, a solid board, uh, you know, anything less than two inches, which is actually an inch and a half, you wouldn't think that it uh, uh, would be very strong. And the weight, no doubt, greater for what the Marahites had to bear, for they were given four wagons and eight oxen to assist them in transporting their parts of the tabernacle. 32. And the pillars of the court round about, and their sockets made of brass, and their pins, you could think of these probably as brass uh, pent tags, and their cords or ropes with all their instruments, and with all their service or tools, and by name ye shall reckon the instruments of the charge of their burden. Verse 33, this is the service or the work of the families of the sons of Merari, according to all their service in the tabernacle of the congregation under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. And again, delegation of authority to uh, Ithamar. Uh, and when we come back in our next lecture, we'll see the actual count of the Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Merarites, which were assigned to the service of the tabernacle. And 